Well, first of all, thank you guys all so much for coming out today. Um, I'm really excited today to talk about um, my favorite study system, which is the dung beetles. Um, and so yes, the title of my presentation today will be How the Humble Dung Beetle Can Help Save the World. So first, I'd like to acknowledge my financial support. I've been really lucky uh, to have a lot of grants um, and fellowships from various sources, as well as uh, for a lot of my field work, the Texas Parks and Wildlife um, provided me with extensive lodging. People showed me where to find things. Uh, it was excellent, so I'm really grateful for all of those people and organizations. So first, I want to introduce um, dung beetles. So as some of you may know, dung beetles are in Scarabaeidae. That's their family, and they're also called scarabs. True dung beetles are in a subfamily called scarabaeinae. So there are other insects that eat dung, but they're not considered true dung beetles. So these are examples of some true dung beetles, scarabaeinae, of which there are about 8,000 species, and they're found pretty much everywhere besides Antarctica. So in our lab, we study a couple of these up here. Um, we primarily study Onthophagus taurus right here, which is actually the strongest animal on Earth. It can lift more than 1,100 times its body weight, which is really cool. So Onthophagus taurus is also called the bullheaded beetle because of these nice little horns it has. The organism that I study primarily is right here. This is called Phaneus vendax, or the rainbow scarab, for obvious reasons. And this is native to Tennessee and a lot of the United States. Um, and this one actually is introduced to Tennessee um, and a lot of parts of the United States. It was introduced, uh, I think, mid this century. We have someone here who can tell us more about that. Uh, but you can find these two in cow pastures. OK, so this is maybe going to be a recap for some of you who came to my advisor's talk a few days ago. But really, I think before uh, I tell you more about the dung beetle, it's important to understand their life history. So dung beetles um, are really broken into three different guilds based on how they bury their brood balls. So what a brood ball is, and you can kind of see it right here, a brood ball is a hollow ball of dung that the mother, sometimes, the mother makes, oftentimes in partnership with uh, her mates, and she lays a single egg within this brood ball. This will be the home of the developing offspring um, until it becomes an adult. So the three different types do basically different things with their brood balls. So this type dwellers, they live just, they live in dung or just below it. Um, they have very kind of simple brood balls. Some just really kind of lay their eggs in the dung itself. Then you have rollers over here to the right. A lot of you have maybe seen uh, videos on National Geographic, which show rollers, you know, scurrying away with their uh, brood balls. And they have some really interesting behaviors and interesting ways of um, knowing where they're going and keeping in a straight line to get away from other dung beetles that might want to steal their prize. Um, ask me more about that later if you'd like. And then finally, we have tunnelers, which are my personal favorite types of dung beetles. We primarily study these in our lab. And tunnelers are going to bury their brood balls either directly below the dung pat, oftentimes in these very like deep tunnels, um, or just kind of right by it. And both of the um, dung beetles that I highlighted in the previous slide are both these tunnelers. So the players that you can see in our story today are cows and their poop. It's a very large cow patty. Um, I've seen very large cow patties before. <laughs> you, you, as you might imagine, um, one of the wonderful parts about our lab is we do, we get to be around a lot of dung. Um, of course, the dung beetle, and then uh, the actual soil and the grass that form its habitat. However, I think that in order to understand a lot of these connections, there's a missing hidden player that's really important, and that's the microbes. And so you have microorganisms, um, which today I'm primarily focusing on bacteria and archaea, which are a lot like bacteria. Um, they're, they're not the same, but very similar. They live in kind of extreme environments, like for example, in hot springs or places without oxygen. And then fungi are also microorganisms, and they're incredibly important, but I won't focus on them as much today. OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is really the connection between the dung beetle and the earth. Um, kind of the soil that it lives in and its habitat. So first thing we want to talk about is why do we care about manure? Why is removing manure important besides the obvious that it doesn't look very nice? As you might imagine, cows don't really like to eat where they have just defecated. Well, one of the reasons this is important is because off manure comes greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases include one we're all very familiar with, carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is not only produced as a product of um, combustion when we drive our cars or in airplanes, it's also produced 
pretty much in every living thing when we go through metabolism. So essentially when we break down food to get energy. Well, the same thing is going on with the microorganisms in the dung pad. Additionally, methane is produced. So I'm sure um, many of you have heard about how, you know, cow farts are going to possibly, you know, are causing global warming. Well, that's, that's one of the factors, but methane is also in their dung. Um, and the methane is produced by these anaerobic bacteria and the archaea that I mentioned. Um, again, when they're trying to obtain energy for their growth and development. And then finally, we have nitrous oxide, um, which is produced in the process essentially when microbes are converting um, different nitrogenous compounds. So nitrogen is really, it's crucial for making proteins. Um, and also organisms can get um, energy from converting some of these compounds. So in terms of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide uh, is actually the least harmful in that methane and nitrous oxide in that order will actually are more efficient at trapping um, sunlight energy in the Earth's atmosphere. So this is some of the problems with dung. And in agriculture, we see that 10 to 12 percent of our whole emissions come from agriculture, which is pretty incredible. Um, and then 15 percent of that is manure. So it's actually a pretty big problem. And so what you see right here is a graph that's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which is supported by the UN. So you guys maybe have seen something like this before. Essentially what it shows is that the three different types of greenhouse gases that I've just mentioned have been rising very quickly since the industrial age, um, about in 1850. Again, as you guys have probably heard many times before. So the cool thing about dung beetles is that they can actually help with this problem. So right here, I have some pictures that I've taken from um, a ranch that was near Buffalo, Texas. You may not know where that is. Um, it's not too far away from College Station in Houston. Um, and this farm had more dung beetles than I've ever seen. It was, it was just beautiful and crawling with life. Um, it, was, it was so gorgeous. And so I took um, a series of pictures, which I'm about to show you, which kind of show you the process of dung beetles breaking down the dung on the soil. So this picture was definitely taken, um, hmm, I would say probably two to three days after uh, the dung was laid. It was very hard to tell because this was swarming with dung beetles. And the rancher I talked to told me that he sees dung disappear in a few days because he has so many dung beetles. Um, and that's in part because of his sandy soil, it's easier for them to dig. So let's say sort of early stage of dung development and you can see a lot of dung beetles in the pat. As you continue, you kind of see it becoming almost this fibrous material with a little bit of dung below. There's still quite a bit of dung below. And then finally you get this almost shredded, looks like some sort of mulch type thing. So this is the process of dung beetles really breaking that down. And they're able to do that because they have these specialized filtering mouth parts. So what the adults do is they are sucking out the liquid parts of the dung, which is really dehydrating it for a lot of other organisms that might live in there. So they're helping to kill some of that bacteria that might off gas that thing. They're helping clean up the cow pastures. And then they're also actually helping um, out compete flies. So I've heard people say, and I've talked to a few uh, people um, from like the USDA and various agricultural extensions that have said that fly populations can be reduced by about 80 to 90 percent if you have a good healthy source of dung beetles. And again, that does depend, of course, on where you are and your soil type and a lot of other factors. But these dung beetles are doing really amazing things. And the remainder of the dung that they're using, they use to make these nice brood balls I talked about. So this is a nice little larvae right here. Oh, and then I should mention too that um, some estimates, again, it depends on where you are and what species you have, are that dung beetles can remove between 80 to 90 percent of the dung from the pastures. So that's huge. So dung beetles, of course, in this process are really helping the grass itself, um, which in turn helps the cows and gives the dung beetles more to eat. So everything kind of works in a nice cycle. I'm going to transition to sitting because my left leg is getting tired. <laughs> um, so when a dung beetle buries its offspring in the brood ball, as I mentioned, only about 15% of the dung is actually eaten by the larvae. So this really does vary species to species. And as you probably can imagine, it's hard for researchers just to go into the field and actually find brood balls. So a lot of this information comes from people in the lab, which may be you know, different conditions that you see in the wild. But the point is, is that a lot of the brood ball stays in the soil even after the offspring emerges from the soil. So here you can see that um, an adult beetle has already popped out of that brood ball. So that's important because that means that a lot of the dung itself, a lot of that nitrogen and carbon and the actual just 
um, organic matter itself is staying in the soil. So it, instead of spreading manure on your fields, if you have dung beetles, they'll do it for you. And they'll bury it so it doesn't smell like sometimes Philip Fulmer does when they put all the manure out there. <laughs> um, so essentially what this is doing in the soil then is this is helping to initiate or initialize and accelerate ammonification. What that means is that when you have nitrogen, nitrogen is really, it's locked into all of our proteins and our amino acids. And that's in a form that plants really can't use. So when the dung beetles are putting this back into the soil, what then happens is that bacteria can access it and they can create it, make it into ammonia and ammonium, which are then sources that plants can use to assimilate into their own tissue. So it's really cool what these guys are doing. And then finally, um, quite a few studies have shown that plants grow faster um, when they've been in soil that has you know, been worked at by dung beetles. Some studies have shown that they have more nitrogen in the plants. Some have not shown any more nitrogen in relation to carbon in the plants. Really, that kind of depends. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of my work talking to ranchers. Um, this is me with the wonderful David Metting. Um, David Metting has been um, in his farm, which is near Yorktown, Texas. Oh, he grew up on the farm. He was an electrician for a stint, went back to it because he loves his cows. And this, is, this farm has been in his family for about 100 years. Um, so I'm the crazy person who, when I'm looking to go somewhere, I call and I say, hi, is this you know, Mr. Metting? And he'll say yes. And I say, I have a really weird question. And usually they don't hang up. And I say, can I look on your ranch for dung beetles? And usually they're so intrigued that I at least get a conversation out of it. <laughs> and <laughs> this guy was, was so nice, I can't even tell you. He, um, after I found my dung beetles and his, his farm was crawling with them, he invited me in for dinner. Um, and it was a very stereotypical Texan dinner. Most of my family's Texan, so I can tell you it was, you know, sweet tea, it was uh, biscuits, it was, we actually had sloppy joes, it was, it was awesome. Um, like homemade coleslaw, you wouldn't even believe it. So this guy had a wonderful, a wonderful farm, and he does a little bit of this, but a lot of the ranchers that I went to, um, because I really try to go to organic farms or farms that don't use a lot of chemicals, they do something which is called managed grazing. Um, so managed grazing is really interesting. So again, we hear a lot about how agriculture and livestock are maybe killing the planet. The thing is, though, is that you know cows are natural too, and there are ways in which you can actually make a cow pasture a sink for carbon, meaning that it will hold more carbon in the soil than it's giving off. So one way of doing this is what's called managed grazing. And I learned, most of this that I've learned, I learned from ranchers. I didn't learn it from, from reading a book or from reading an article. I learned it from talking to people who their family's done it or they tried it out themselves or they learned it from an extension. And there are several different ways of managing. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're rotating the cattle from pasture to pasture. Um, on some uh, people's farms that I went to in ranches, they're doing this up to three times a day. Other people will do it every couple of weeks. There's really a lot of variability, but the idea is that you're letting each paddock rest for a little while, and then you're moving the cattle somewhere else where the grass is more lush and fertile. So this allows your grass to grow back. Um, it's something that cow and bison will do naturally in the wild anyway. And then another really crucial thing is that it allows a lot of the pathogens and parasites that live in cows to die because a lot of these parasites are transmitted through the dung. If they are defecating here, they're moved away. This maybe hasn't, they haven't been on this for a little while. They're not going to get a lot of those parasites again. So it's a way of keeping your cows a whole lot healthier and you can actually reduce the inputs that you put on your farm in general, which is really cool. Um, so this was something that was really exciting for me to hear. Um, and then a lot of the farms that I went to, like uh, Mr. Metting's farm, uh, the B2 Ranch, which was the picture I showed you earlier, these people, they're not planting sod, they're, they're not using corn, and they don't have an organic certification. They just, they're doing what works best for them. And what they find works best is letting the natural grassland grow and letting the cows eat on it. And the cows will sort of, you know, switch from one type of grass to another, depending on what they say, how they're feeling that day, how their stomach is feeling, depending on, um, you know, what's in season. And really, so what, we're, what I'm seeing on a lot of these is I'm seeing a huge, huge diversity of dung beetles. I'm seeing a lot of other insects. I'm seeing, you know, birds. I'm seeing, um, I saw a bobcat on one of these. I saw a badger. Very cool stuff. And so I think sometimes that um, ranching and cow, cattle farms get a bad rap, but I can tell you it's in the most beautiful places I've been. 
um, with these ranchers that care about it so much. Okay, um, so now I'm going to transition a little bit into talking about um, my research. So I went to all of these different farms and ranches to collect dung beetles to study their gut microbiome. Um, and I'll ex what? Before you get on to this new thing, I'm just dying to know, do dung beetles fart? <laughs> um, I would say, yeah, yeah. They, they do. So I, I, I can't, I've never, you know, empirically measured that. But I will say, given what's going on in their guts, um, I think everything farts. Okay, but it's probably a lot less in total than if the dung stays with a cow. Um, so you're saying, would, would uh, the manure would by itself fart easier. more than the dung beetle? <laughs> the kind of the off gas. That, that is a guess, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, I can't speak to that, but I do know that the t when people have done these um, experiments where they essentially have everything in a closed chamber, they do see le or, you know, less of these gases coming off when dung beetles are there than they do when they're not. Um, and there are some nuances there in that it really depends on the diversity of dung beetles. Turns out biodiversity is really important. Um, it depends on you know, the type of land you're on. There are a lot of factors, but in general, yes. But yeah, no, they haven't. You know, it'd, it'd be interesting, I suppose, if they were able to, you know, partition out dung beetle fart versus <laughs> what's coming off of the, of the manure. Um, <laughs> good question. So yeah, now I'm going to talk um, about the gut microbiome, which is something that I study. And um, for me, I, I've become so interested in microorganisms, but you, you can't work with dung beetles without just really, I think, falling in love with how dorky they are when they fly, their abilities to really help clean out pastures, and then just talking to all these ranchers. Um, and so this experience was really cool to get to think about all these factors together. So the main question motivating my personal research is what factors shape the gut microbiome of Thaneus, which is that species I mentioned to you earlier, the rainbow dung beetle, across its range. So first, a little bit of background on the gut microbiome. I know that a lot of you guys have heard about it in the news. Basically, you say anything, and people will say, oh, it's related to the gut microbiome, whether it's depression, anxiety, um, I don't know stress, obesity, anything you want to talk about. Well, in a lot of animals, um, the gut microbiome is very, very important. And so a lot of its functions include things like behavior. So they find that in certain types of flies, your gut microbiome will actually dictate maybe if you want to mate or not and who you mate with. Um, things like metabolism. So metabolism and digestion is perhaps breaking down the food that you eat. That's really important for us. Also things like development, so certain cues as you're developing are due to your gut microbiome, and there are really a whole host of, of other things that the gut microbiome does for us and other organisms uh, that I could get into. Um, and so some cool examples here are, this is an aphid, and aphids actually have to have their gut microbiome. They can't survive without it, because when they eat sap, um, they really don't get a lot of the nutrients and the amino acids that they need, and so their gut microbiome helps provision them with those. Um, these are termites, which are very well known for their gut microbiome, which helps them break down wood. So a lot of cool stuff going on there. So now to get a little bit more into dung beetle natural history, which is very important for understanding the gut microbiome. So I mentioned that dung beetles make these brood balls. So here's a rolling dung beetle, and apparently we're in Egypt, but I thought that this was a very nice figure. <laughs> I don't know, they have dung beetles there, they used to worship them. Um, so you have the female rolling it over here, she's going to uh, lay a single egg actually in this brood ball right here and then she does something else really weird. So this is a real picture. This is a, um, an egg from a dung beetle, the actual Omphophagus taurus I showed you earlier with the cool horns. And you can't really see it but right underneath here there's a little bit of goo. And this goo is called the pedestal. And it is, um, well, it's stuff from her own digestive system that she excretes right here. So it's her gut microbiome. It's a maternal gift, we sometimes call it. And this maternal gift is the first thing that this baby will eat when it hatches from its egg. So what it's doing, in fact, is it's inoculating its own gut with the gut microbiome of its mother, which is super cool. Um, and so it will use this gut microbiome as it develops completely underground from a larval stage, the pupa, and then eventually to an adult. And as I'll get in a bit more, um, it's predicted that this gut microbiome is helping it break down well, what the cows don't want. A lot of this stuff that's even hard for the cows to digest. And there's been work also that's shown that it's helping it survive when temperatures are 
um, non, not favorable, such as too hot or too cold, and also when there are desiccation stresses underground. So it's very important. Um, oh, I guess I already mentioned this, sorry about that. Well, there's another picture of a cool dung beetle. And then um, the last thing which is really important for people who are considering evolution is that the gut microbiome also leads to what we call fitness proxies. So some of these fitness proxies include a quicker development time, so that means it takes less time to actually reach adulthood, and then also um, you're larger when you actually are an adult. So that means that in turn you can have more babies, and then thinking of Darwinian evolution, this means that those should be selected for uh, because you have more offspring. So what my project looks at is I'm looking at two species of dung beetle. I know you can't tell they're different. They are. <laughs> it's very hard to tell. I have to get a magnifying glass um, to tell them apart. But two species of dung beetle. This is the one I talked about already. And this is another species called Phaneus deformis. So this is the horned rainbow scarab. And this is just the rainbow scarab, even though they both have giant horns. I don't know. So my focus area was here in the central center of the country, which was very useful for me because I'm from Oklahoma City. And um, I have ranchers in my family. My parents know a lot. And I called a lot of random people. Um, people that were very nice and let me store dung beetles and ethanol in their fridge. I kid you not. It's the things people will do when you ask them. Anyway, so um, Phaneus vindex and Phaneus deformis. Phaneus vindex is really found throughout the United States. And you can see it here um, in this blue area. Now, Phaneus deformis is found in this green area with Phaneus vindex. We call that in sympatry. So sim, kind of like symmetry, meaning same. And patry, like patria, or like um, patriotic, so that means sort of your home. So together home, an allopatry is away, and it's found in allopatry, so away from Phaneus vindex, down here in southern and central Texas. Although as you'll see, um, this range map was not put together by me, someone else, and I, I found that it's not exactly right, but that's okay. So niche partitioning means that when these two beetles come into contact with one another in areas such as Oklahoma, northern and eastern uh, Texas, they might shift part of their niche. So that means, that, let's say that when Phaneus vindex is in Missouri, it can exist on any soil type, it can eat sort of whatever it wants, but then when it comes into contact with Phaneus deformis, it suddenly has something it's competing with. And so it can't eat whatever it wants because there's something else that is living where it wants to live, eating what it wants to live, and so instead what they do is they divide up where they live. And so what we see here is that Phaneus vindex, we think, probably buries its brood balls um, closer to the surface. So it ha still has space to live. And also, it can exist on a lot of different soil types, whereas Phaneus deformis really prefers sand. So that's a way in which they're avoiding each other, are able to coexist, and um, are not competing for the same resources as much. So my question then becomes, does niche partitioning also change the gut microbiome? So when we see them in sympatry, where they occur together, do we also see that their gut microbiomes are different? So maybe they can do different things with those gut microbiomes that are so important for their survival and their development. So I have a couple of predictions, and I'll help you walk through these. So the first prediction is that the gut microbiome of Phaneus vindex and Phaneus deformis um, this one, unfortunately, has been dissected before someone asks me about that. That's why he's missing part of his abdomen. Um, that their gut microbiome will be more similar where they occur away from one another because they're freed up from competition than when they occur together where they have to be spatially different, they have to do slightly different things um, to avoid competition. So that's the first prediction. And the second prediction is that because Phaneus vindex is found on a lot of different soil types and really kind of across the United States, you might expect that it also has more varied gut microbiome to exist in these different ways, to live on these different habitats. You know, also if you are in New York and South Texas, you might be more different. New York and Texas might be more different from each other than Phaneus deformis that only lives in Oklahoma and Texas. So in order to ask this question, I went to Mm, this is 17 sites. I actually went to more about 30. You have some successes, some failures, across three states um, where I collected about 15 female beetles. And the reason that I collected female beetles is because if you remember back to how the gut microbiome is transmitted, the females are the ones that transmit it to the offspring. So it was a way to kind of make sure that that was consistent from all these different areas. And so in blue is where I found only Phaneus vindex. So again, I told you maybe this range map's a little bit off. 
Yellow is where I found only Phaneus Vindex, and then green is where I found them both together. So in order to do this, um, my advisor showed you guys this uh, last, or a few weeks ago, is I have a wire right here that I suspend over a cone. Down here, there's a yogurt cup buried into the soil, and then I hang a piece of dung to bait them in. The beetles walk over here, and they slide in the cup, and then I collect them. And here's my hand with um, Phaneus Vindex on one of the ranches I was on. Um, I also collected soils, soil samples from all these different locations, so I can say, okay, are their gut microbiomes different because they live here or here, or is it something about the soil here that's really weird? What, what's actually causing the gut microbiome to be as it is? And then additionally, I also um, am gathering just from published data sets online, the precipitation, the temperature variation at all these locations to also say, could that be what's changing the gut microbiome? So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of the lab work. Um, and if you have questions or want me to go more in depth, please let me know. So the first thing I did was I dissected out the dung beetle's guts and I extracted and copied the DNA. So I extracted the DNA with uh, this kit that a lot of people use, it, use, but essentially it uses chemistry to pull out negatively charged DNA from everything else in the gut in a series of steps. Then I did what's called polymerase chain reaction, which replicates your DNA into a lot of different copies. Um, that was something that was only invented, really kind of became widespread in the late 80s, early 90s, um, and has just transformed biology. So there's me doing some lab work. Um, Next, what I did is I sent off my samples to a sequencing facility we have here on campus, which is in SURF, and what they did is they took the DNA that I gave them, and they got back all of these peaks. They got back these letters that make up DNA, so I know what these DNA sequences are. Um, and without going into too much detail, essentially what they do when they're sequencing it is they again replicate the DNA, and each time the DNA grows a little bit, it gives off a different signal. And so the machine is reading this and saying, okay, I'm seeing an A, I'm seeing a T, I'm seeing a G. Oops. Um, so yes, I get all these sequences back. And to give you a sense of how much data I have, um, the data that I got back is 1.5 gigabytes. Um, and it's all text. All it is is seeing these letters over and over and over again. But it's in the millions, um, billions of letters that I'm getting back. It's a whole library, which is really cool. And then finally what I do is bioinformatics and statistics. So I do a lot of coding to essentially line up all the sequences I got. And you can see here that the sequences are a little bit different. Maybe there's a deletion here. Maybe you have some extra ones here. They're a little bit different. And what these DNA sequences act as, as a barcode. So I can say, okay, what is it? Is it um, gamma protea bacteria? Is it a, what is the species of bacteria that I'm seeing back? So it's, a, it's really interesting to be able to go, you know, in a very short time from a dung beetle gut to figuring out everything that's in it. It's, it just amazes me constantly. And then I do a lot of fancy stats. <laughs> so first, I'm, I'm going to describe some of my preliminary results to you. Um, I'm still looking at how the dung beetle changes across space, but I have results from one population that I finished. So to kind of describe my figure first, I want to describe how we actually say how is one community, so you think of one beetle that has all these different bacterial species in its gut, different from this. You can't really just, there's not really a number you can get with one and two, you know, because they can not only differ in what species they have in the gut, but how many of those species they have, and you're also dealing with something like 10,000 different species in each, each beetle's gut. So essentially what we do is I take every single beetle I have, and I have 270, and you compare it with every other beetle that you have, and you develop a distance, which is based on the species that they share, and the number that they share, and then the total number of species that they have in their guts. And you do this to sort of find out a distance between all these different um, individuals of beetles. So next what you do is, um, I'm gonna gloss over this a bit, but please do ask if you have questions, is you do what's called, you basically do a multivariate analysis. So with something that is in community ecology, because we have so many different members together, you can't say X predicts Y. Instead, X, maybe the species of beetle, predicts all of these different things, up to 10,000. And so you have, you can't just say here's X and here's Y and put how X causes Y on you know, a normal abacus. Instead, 
you use this kind of fancy statistical technique called eigenvectors and a distance-based redundancy analysis to condense down this variation, and you can see how these partition out in space. Um, so again, please ask me about that later if you want. I know I'm really glossing over that. But what you see here when we really try to reduce a lot of this variation down to what's the most important is that Phaneus Vindex, which is shown in red, and Phaneus Deformis, which is shown in black, really do segregate out based on their gut microbiome. So essentially what that means is that the, the species of beetle does predict, or if you see the gut microbiome, the species of beetle will predict, sorry, I said that wrong. I'm trying to like say it and explaining it in a normal way. Um, the species of beetle is predictive when you have your gut microbiome. So you can tell which species it is based on their gut microbiome. Um, so that is my first result. So now to kind of make it a little bit more concrete for you, that was just the first slab of yes, they are different, um, is that we see the same families are found in both species. So these are different families of bacteria that are found in Phaneus vindex and Phaneus deformis. So these different colors are different families of bacterial species, and it all looks pretty similar. This is the relative abundance, so basically you get up to 100% here, and this is just, you know, let's say this is about 17% of this family uh, constitutes P. vindex, and it's about 15% in P. deformis, and so on and so forth. However, when you look down <coughs> within these families, we see that some of the most common species within the gut actually are different between these two species. And what's really interesting is that these differences are actually based on things that should be breaking down the dung. So in yellow, we have the Sphingobacteriaceae right here, and this is aids in cellulose digestion. That means that Phaneus vindex and Phaneus deformis have different members within that family. So they're different. They could be differing slightly on their ability to, di to digest cellulose, on what temperatures they do it best at. And we see the same thing for these other three um, families of bacteria where they're breaking down lignocellulose. So lignocellulose is um, a compound that's found a lot in dung. Um, cellulose is dung. That's a plant material that's very hard to break down. Humans actually can't do it. Um, and then finally, infixation. So nitrogen fixation is really important because dung um, has, it doesn't have the right type of nitrogen to incorporate into proteins. So we see their gut microbiome is allowing them to do things um, to live off of this dung, which is really cool. So in summary of my research is that we see that the gut microbiome of Phaneus uh, is different in sympatry. So these two different species do have different gut microbiomes where they come together. And I predict, once I finish analyzing the rest of my data, that we'll see more differences when the two beetle species are together, where they co-occur, than when they occur apart. And again, I think that's because they're switching their behaviors and their habitats slightly when they co-occur. Co um, and then finally, these differences might matter for breaking down cow dung and thus overall beetle fitness, so how many offspring you can have. And to bring this back, I think a very interesting question, and this is a question that I plan to um, investigate more at the University of Colorado, possibly with ants, is how are insects, in this case dung beetles, changing the soil? So when they do these really cool things for the soil, like injecting it with carbon and nitrogen and reducing runoff and making plants grow, it's not the dung beetles. It has to be the bacteria and the archaea in the soil that are doing these things, and the fungi. So my question then is, how are the dung beetles actually changing the soil? We don't really know, so we see how they're doing all, we see that they're doing these things. We see that it's making plants grow bigger, but we don't know the mechanisms that are doing that. So it may be that the dung beetle's gut microbiome, some of it gets into the soil, we don't know. It could be that the dung beetle's gut microbiome is really coming a lot from the dung and it's putting that in the soil. But when you have these same things, like cellulose digestion, lignocellulose digestion, that are occurring to break down the dung in the beetle's gut, those things continue in the soil. So are some of those bacteria species the same? Is the soil able to do that because of the bacteria that the dung beetles are bringing? That's a question that's open at this point and I think is really interesting. So that's all I have for you today. Um, I have a lot of people to thank. The lovely Sheldon Lab who came today to support me. Thank you so much. Um, my advisor, Dr. Kimberly Sheldon, um, someone on my committee, various people that have helped me um, kind of figure out some of these the lab work and statistics. Um, my boyfriend, Nate, who uh, <laughs> has kind of been my guinea pig with a lot of these things. And then my mom, who uh, when I was 
first struggling with some of the stuff actually helped me drive to some of my sites and I can't even tell you how much she did. I mean, this woman helped me set up dung bait. I mean, she's, <laughs> she's crazy, crazy wonderful. So yeah, thank you all so much. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions you guys have. So they're saving the world because they're improving soil and they're able to do it in a way that doesn't require as many fertilizer inputs, which is really important. Um, and then additionally, as I talked about, they make it so, uh, safer for cows. And so you're able to um, not give cows as many antibiotics, as many um, like antiparasitics. They're not having as many flies. So flies actually cause a whole lot of damage on cattle pastures each year. Um, because they're damaging their skin. They can sometimes help infect the udders, which makes it hard for them to get milk. So dung beetles um, are helping in all of those ways. And then additionally, they can actually help, as I mentioned, lower the greenhouse gases that are coming off the manure, um, which in turn can help slow down global warming. Yeah? So do cattle farmers have to introduce these dung beetles, or do they just show up? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great question. So we do have native dung beetles in the United States. Um, so native dung beetles include uh, the rainbow ones I showed you. We do have some smaller, we have tunnelers, we have rollers, we have dwellers, but a lot of the dung beetles in the United States were imported um, really in kind of the 20th century. And so a lot of those are the bullheaded beetles. And it's kind of this interesting trade-off because some of the imported ones are the very best at bearing cow dung. And that could be because they're from places where there are cows, so they co-evolved to do it. Um, but it's this interesting thing where it's like, okay, they're providing this ecosystem service where they're helping recycle this thing, but they're also invasive. And so um, someone in our lab actually does work to kind of look at what happens when these introduced young beetles come into contact with these native ones. Um, but it's interesting you say that because there are places in the world where they really don't have very many dung beetles at all. So New Zealand is a case where there's a lot of cattle farming that goes on in New Zealand, no native dung beetles that I know of. Or if they were, there, there weren't very many. And so they introduced a lot of those and it's kind of the only way they can keep their, you know, their, their pastures clean. Yeah, great question. Yeah? Mm -hmm. on those services. Has anybody done that with dung beetles? Um, I'm kind of, yes and no. Uh, so there was a paper, uh, and I can't remember the figure, but it was by someone named Losi that was published in the early aughts. Um, and this person did try to quantify dung beetles. At the same time, they were talking about other soil dwelling organisms. Um, and then there was also uh, another paper by a guy named Nichols that really kind of laid out a lot of the things that dung beetle do, do and also um, put a number on it. I can't remember the number, it's in the billions, but it's hard because dung beetles are in decline to kind of save these things. It really depends on where you go. And then another thing that's important to think about when you're measuring the um, benefits of dung beetles is that we don't really know the ecological impacts of these introduced dung beetles on other dung beetles in the pasture already. Um, overall, I mean, it's, they can help tremendously. So a lot of the ranches that I went on, they don't really do any, they don't put any inputs into their cattle anymore. So they don't have to supplement them with feed in the winter. Now granted, they are in Texas and Oklahoma, which are more mild than a lot of places, but they don't have to do as much as their neighbors because the dung beetles are helping the plants grow better. They're helping the soil. They are, you know, drastically reducing the fly populations and other pest populations such as helminths, which live in their guts. Well, they're not helping reduce that, but they're keeping everything cleaner in general and um, they don't have to apply a lot of these things. So it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly, but it's in the billions. Yes, um, and so not my personal theory. I didn't get to it because I was like, oh, there's so much to talk about. People don't want to hear me talk about dung beetles all day like I could. Um, but thank you for humoring me for as long as you did. Uh, <laughs> um, so yes, there's a chemical called ivermectin. Um, and so ivermectin is given to dogs for heartworms. It's also given to cattle for uh, some intestinal worms that they get. 
The thing is, though, is that ivermectin is broad spectrum. So ivermectin will actually pretty much kill any kind of insect. I mean, anything, any insect, any worm, any nematode, they show uh, it messes with kind of their neurons, with their, um, with their brain activity. Um, not that they really have true brains, but it can kind of make them disoriented. It can change their behaviors. Um, and so, yes, that's one of the major reasons that dung beetles are in decline. Um, and so the great thing about this pasture system here is when you rotate these cows, you're not only letting your grass get rest so it can grow up again, but um, these intestinal worms that cows get have a life cycle of about 60 days, which I learned from a lot of these farmers. And so if you move a lot of these cattle, when they defecate out these, these nematodes, or not these, these helminths, into the, they get into the soil, but if you move them out of that area, then they're not going to pick them back up at the same rate versus if these cows were just to stay here all day. Because at some point, you're eating where you defecated out a helminth not that long ago. Um, so yes, ivermectin is a big reason why these things are in decline. Um, they are trying to make some other um, dung beetle friendly uh, chemicals that will kill these worms, but um, there's not a lot of research done by academics that have shown how some of these other compounds work, so it's a huge issue. And then, of course, there are other things that, you know, like everything else, other broad-spectrum pesticides, temperature changes due to climate change, precipitation, land use changes, you, you name it. Awesome. Uh, how long will a dung beetle live? Mm -hmm. And how many eggs will the females? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just trying to get an idea of lifespan and uh, what the creature does all the time and then yeah are they they're eating the dung as well mm -hmm. okay yes um, so to answer the first thing I'm sorry if that wasn't clear enough um, so the dung beetles are eating the dung so they use these filtering mouth parts so really they're kind of sucking out the gross juices which is why you see it look so shredded like it is because they're they are drinking basically all of the nutrients out of it. And so they're getting a lot of bacteria from the dung, they're getting little, little pieces of the cow's intestines and what have you. And then more of the solid parts of the dung is what they use to actually make this brood ball. Um, so yes. And then to your other question, that's not exactly known, and it also varies from species to species, because um, there are 8,000 species. So the species I work with, the rainbow scarab, it's thought they live about a year, um, but these are also you know, eaten by a lot of things. And so what we see in the lab is gonna be very different from you know, how they are in the wild, but they usually can have like two different peaks of reproduction per year. Um, it really depends. And then so other species that we work with in the lab, uh, like Onthophagus, the bullheaded beetle, I'm not sure how long they live. Do you guys know? About a year. About a year also. How, how long from egg to hatch to adult? Yeah, so that also really varies. So I think it's about three weeks to a month for Onthophagus taurus, okay. right? Um, but with my species, the Phaneus vendex, the rainbows, we have, <laughs> I've never raised them because we have not had success in the lab, but other people that have um, have seen anywhere from 8 to 12 months. So it's a very, very long time underground. Um, and I think that there are, people haven't investigated this too much, but there are undoubtedly cues like temperature and moisture that would kind of, you know, get them to come out earlier. And uh, I'm sorry to go, no, you're on, good. go on, but uh, uh, they're eaten, you say, by a number of other creatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, one that I've seen which is really interesting is a loggerhead shrike, I think what it's called. I'm not a birder, but um, when I was in Texas, I saw a dung beetle, one of my rainbow scarabs, impaled on barbed wire uh, by a loggerhead shrike. So birds are gonna eat them, um, you know, probably some small mammals, a lot of things, kind of, they're at the bottom of the food chain, so I think a lot of things would snack on a dung beetle. Um, but they do have their nice hard shell, so they're a little harder to eat. Mm -hmm. How many eggs do they lay per life span? Yeah, so I haven't seen good numbers on that. I'm not really sure if it's known. Um, so I find all my beetles in the wild, and my particular species is not as well studied. Um, so do you guys know with Onthophagus taurus, these people in our lab uh, actually rear them in the lab. I, I don't think there's a good estimate, is there? I, I can tell you that the females that we breed, one female and a male, can produce 50 or 60 beetles in a couple months. So there are no other. I don't know like a lifetime measure, the number of eggs one female can lay. It's also in the lab, of course, they're basically getting as much dung as they want. 
whereas in the wild they might be competing with others in their species and others outside of their species uh, for the dung, which could, could also constrain how many eggs they lay. And yeah. In the wild, over what temperature range do they thrive? Like 40 Fahrenheit to 120 or what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Sorry, I'm always like, it varies. Uh, that actually really varies too. So my particular species, gonna bring him up. I'll just bring back this page with the big one. So my species right here, um, I showed you guys that one of the two species is really found in Oklahoma and Texas, and the other one is found pretty much everywhere um, in the United States. So really kind of what that means is that they're just going to stay underground and inactive when it's too cold. So we see the most like, they'll start coming out here like in April or May. Um, and they'll be active through like September or October. So really that's kind of their ideal temperature if you can think about what that's like in Tennessee. Um, and then if you move farther up north, they'll come out later and they'll go in earlier. Um, but they seem to be pretty sensitive to heat. So I unfortunately, um, Oklahoma gets very, very hot in the summer. Uh, I was doing field work in 2018 and it was 110 one day. And the dung beetles, they were in the shade in their little containers underground, and they were out there for like an hour, and I went back and grabbed them. Because you know, you wait for a while for them to go to your trap, and by the time I got there, they weren't dead, but they were dead that night. And so they seemed to be a little bit more sensitive to extreme heat. So this past summer, um, I either kept them in air conditioning or I put them in a cooler that I kept to be about 80 degrees. Um, because you know, if it's the hot of the day, they'll come up, maybe grab some dung, hang out, hang out in the cool dung, and then go back in. Yeah, good question. Uh-huh. Anybody estimating how much of the greenhouse gases come from animals on around the world? Yeah, so um, do, do, do. got a slide on that. Where did I put it? Yeah, so about 15% of agricultural admissions are coming off of manure. Okay. Um, and so I think other things that would be included in that would be like transportation, the cat, I mean, you know, like the tractor that you're running, things like that. Um, and then of this 15%, I think it's about 60% are cows. So cows produce a whole lot more of this than would say, you know, a chicken and pigs produce quite a bit too. Um, and manure is a huge reason for, you know, manure is a big deal for a lot of reasons I didn't even talk about. So one thing of course is that if, you know, manure gets in the waterways, it's a big issue, not only for human health and for potential pathogens, but also because it can cause eutrophication where essentially you get these algal blooms because you have a lot of nitrogen coming in from the manure. Um, so in, when was it, 90s or aughts, Toledo, Ohio actually like had to shut down its public water supply because there was so much eutrophication going on um, in their public water supply. And I think that was due to agricultural runoff. I think what I saw was that it was a bit manure and then probably also fertilizer, but it can cause some of the same exact problems. Yeah? And lab-grown beetles, um, and you feed them mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, so uh, we're definitely the favorite in our building in Hessler. In fact, someone told me today, she's like, I think it smells like dung today. And I was like, yeah, probably. Um, so what we do is we actually, we go out to a local farm uh, here, a, a farm that doesn't use any chemicals, and we scoop it up, which is a lot of fun, put it in buckets, also very fun, transport it back, and then autoclave it, the most fun. So autoclaves are these big machines that essentially will pressurize and heat up to, to a high temperature, whatever you put in there, to sterilize it and kill most of the bacteria. Um, so, because it smells so much, we do it after hours. <laughs> um, but you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a cow field. Cow, cow fields don't, cow poop smells, but not nearly as bad if, if that whole field was filled with like pig or, or human dung. So we so feed them autoclave dung. Has anybody done the control uh, in the lab of <laughs> sterilized versus non-sterilized to look at their gut microbiome? Um, not that I've seen, so something I didn't mention is when I grab these in the field to kind of standardize it because I don't know what they're eating. Um, in Oklahoma and Texas, uh, feral hogs are a really big problem. And so if you're in a cattle pasture, they're probably only eating cattle dung, but if you're in a wild area, like I went to a lot of wildlife management areas, you don't know what they're eating. So I feed them autoclaved cow dung for four days and I keep them alive, um, make sure they eat with the idea of kind of, if they have anything really weird hanging out in their guts, hopefully it's flushed out by that time. Um, so that was something that I was interested in doing and someone on my committee said that I should do, but it just logistically got a little bit too hard, but it'd be, it'd be a great thing to look at. And um, I would also be interested in seeing if you have these native dung beetles that are eating cattle versus bison dung, which they would have evolved with, 
what the differences would be there. And I would imagine you would see differences for sure. Um, but as the gut microbiome is passed down from mother to offspring, you know, kind of what that inheritance would look like, how much that would change, it, it's not really clear. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, unraveling the sources of the gut microbial variation is really hard because you're dealing with 10,000 different things within a gut that can vary. Um, and doing manipulative experience, experiments, you can do something like where you give them autoclave versus not, but, um, you know, trying to figure out where this species or that species comes from is really hard, which is why we do these multivariate statistics that I probably confused you with because I didn't explain it well. <laughs> yeah? Is there a difference in some people population where you have more, uh, more industrialized, like a dairy farm uh -huh. where the cattle are not grazing, not free range, not grazing naturally, and they just collect the manure, spread it out over the field, does that change at all? Yeah, so I've never gathered there because my thought, well, because that would probably change the gut microbiome so much. I'm sure you'd see a huge, um, you know, just, how to put it, you'd see reflection of that. Um, but what I can say is that, you know, the majority of cows don't live in as nice of conditions as the farms I work on. Um, most of them spend, you know, the last three to four months of their life, like I think it's something like 80% in, you know, these really high concentrated industrial farms like you might see. And in order to keep you know, cows in that close proximity. Sometimes they get more diseases, they have to get them antibiotics. Um, being so close to one another, you can imagine that they're probably just sicker in general. Um, and then if you are eating basically where you defecate, you know, it's gonna change it there. So no one that I know of has looked at that explicitly, but I would imagine you'd see a lot of changes. But that's a, a, good, a good question. I don't think you'd see as many either. Um, simply because of all those things I mentioned. There's a lot of disturbance going on. And then also, you know, cattle are also trampling the ground. And so, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, did you hear all that? Do I need to repeat anything? Oh, gotcha, okay. Yeah, so no one's looked at that, but I would imagine you wouldn't see as many there. So um, when I was in Texas about, where was I? I was about right here in Texas. I was in um, what historically has been the richest county in the United States. Uh, because I was on this really interesting dairy farm by this family that is a Spanish family that got their land from the Spanish king in like the 1700s or something crazy. And they have this massive, massive operation where historically they've done cattle, but now they're bringing on a lot of oil and natural gas. And I looked at it there and they had what looks like it should have been the right soil type. I saw some nearby, I didn't see any there. But I know that they were giving them a lot of inputs because they told me they were really nice people but I, I didn't see any of my species. Um, I saw some of the ones that I think of as being a little bit more kind of hardy, um, but my species I didn't see. So yeah, I wish there was more on that because it's really interesting and that kind of gets to you know, the big question about land use change, so it's a good question. We are so grateful for your talk today and for the research you do. Thank you. And we wish you well in Colorado. Thank you so Thank much. You.